Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Turifigalanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I am hosting this educational activity today on stroke in women. We have exceptional speakers who will be sharing their expertise on the topic. Um, as per usual, and before introducing today's moderator, uh, we will have a quick look at some of our housekeeping rules. We welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, of course, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. We also have prepared some poll questions that we invite you to participate in as they pop up on your screen. You can, of course, use the chat box to say hi or leave your comments throughout the webinar. I do want to remind you that the webinar is recorded and that the recording link will be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy webinar page, as well as shared with all of you via email. And lastly, we kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar so you can share your feedback with us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator, Dr. Elisa C. Miller, Assistant Professor of Neurology in the Division of Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease, Columbia University Department of Neurology in the United States. Dr. Miller, first of all, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to participate and introduce these terrific speakers. So I'll just move right in and introduce our first speaker. So um, Dr. Maria Luisa Zede is a neurologist at um, the Local Health Authority of Reggio Emilia in Italy. I can't pronounce the whole name in Italian, I apologize. She is the local coordinator of stroke pathways and her main interests involve stroke management, small vessel disease, hemorrhagic stroke, fibromuscular dysplasia, rare causes of stroke and neuroimaging. And she's also co-chair of the WISE group within the European Stroke Organization and member of the task force on gender and diversity um, in EAN. So, this is um, really an honor to have you speaking to us today about atrial fibrillation and stroke in women. And before we move forward with the talk, which has been pre-recorded, um, I'm just gonna ask that we launch this little poll for a little pre-test and um, go ahead and fill that out. And then we'll see if we learn the answer during the talk. So with that, you can go ahead and start. Okay, here's our poll results. It looks like there is a mix of answers, so I look forward to um, finding out which one is correct. Go ahead and start the video. Good afternoon. First of all, I would thank you, the organizer, for the kind invitation to attend uh, this uh, um, webinar. And my topic is atrial fibrillation and stroke in women. My name is Maria Luisa Zed. I'm a neurologist, a stroke neurologist, and I work in Azienda Unita Sanitaria Locale di Reggio Emilia in Italy. And this is my disclosures, and my main disclosure is the involvement in the topic as co-chair of ESO Wise Group and member of the Task Force on Gender and Diversity of the European Academy of Neurology. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia worldwide. Its estimated prevalence is lower in women than in men, but elevated BMI, arterial hypertension, diabetes, coronary and valvular disease, heart failure constitute major risk factors for AF. 
AF is partially irritable, but some studies uh, suggesting differences in AF genetics uh, uh, did not conclude uh, about uh, a real difference between women and men. There are sex-specific differences in epidemiology, pathophysiology, presentation, prognosis, treatment of AF. So women with AF experience worse symptoms, uh, atypical symptoms, poorer quality of life and a higher risk of stroke and death than men. Finally, the true prevalence is likely to be substantially higher given that many individuals remain undiagnosed. This is the outline of my presentation and we will start uh, talking about the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation in uh, men and women. An um, interesting consideration is that uh, in North America and European population, the age-adjusted incidence of AF uh, is uh, 1.5 twofold higher in men than women. And uh, the incidence increases disproportionately with increasing age in both women and uh, men. So finally, the, the age-adjusted prevalence of AF is lower in women than in men. But because women typically live longer than men, the absolute number of women with AF are higher than uh, the absolute number of uh, men with AF in uh, medical data in the USA. So as you can see in this picture, the overall prevalence of atrial fibrillation in different uh, countries is equal, Portugal for example, UK, uh, or uh, higher in men than women. We can conclude that uh, uh, male sex is uh, not significantly associated with atrial fibrillation only after a multivariable risk score for incident AF uh, in a population study. Over the past 50 years, the prevalence of major risk factor has changed in both women and men with a population. And in particular, BMI has increased significantly. And in the women's health study, the population attributable risk of AF with increased BMI uh, was 18.5%. So BMI combined with systolic hypertension or, or hypertension uh, in general confer the higher risk for AF in both sexes. And women with other population have an higher prevalence of hypertension and vascular disease. They have also a lower prevalence of uh, coronary heart disease than men with AF. Let's move to pathophysiology. The number of studies investigating sex related differences in the pathophysiology underlying atrial fibrillation are really limited. Uh, the mechanisms uh, remain uh, scarcely understood. Women generally have a reduced ventricular wall thickness and smaller left atria and ventricles uh, in comparison with men. At, in one study uh, of patients undergoing catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, women require more extensive ablation of non-pulmonary vein falsely than men. And uh, this, this issue suggests that the um, pattern of electrical heterogeneity uh, is variable by sex. And whether estrogen uh, has a direct role in the reduced incidence of AF in women uh, compared with men remains really uncertain. Most women develop atrial fibrillation uh, in the elderly, uh, often after menopause. And hormone replacement therapy in the postmenopausal woman uh, no, does not seem to be associated with the risk of incident atrial fibrillation. And female sex uh, is also a risk factor for uh, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction in individuals with AF uh, and for uh, heart failure with uh, preserved age accentuation. In this table, you can see a summary of, of the main sex differences in prevailing mechanisms uh, uh, predisposing to atrial fibrillation, for example, in men, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular risk factors, uh, uh, excessive sports, uh, high PMR uh, metabolic disease are prevalent in comparison with women. And uh, in women uh, are more prevalent heart failure, uh, hypertension, heart ventricular hypertrophy, valvular disease, uh, and also metabolic disease with uh, increased epicardial fat and um, high BMI. 
and uh, in men uh, we also have potential proarrhythmic mechanism uh, that increase the prevalence of attribution in men uh, linked to uh, hormonal factors so detrimental testosterone effects on um, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease and proarrhythmic effect of testosterone and in women there are potential antiarrhythmic mechanisms uh, reducing the prevalence uh, uh, before the menopause uh, so for example um, if it's questionable yes but uh, uh, there could be uh, beneficial estrogen effects on cardiovascular risk factor or uh, uh, antiarrhythmic estrogen effect on um, artery electrical features and, and so on this picture provides us a summary of the potential sex specific differences in atrial fibrillation pathophysiological mechanisms for example, genetic factors uh, are not yet fully identified, but uh, risk factors and endocrine factors uh, are well known. So women uh, have a high prevalence of hypertension, vascular disease, and lower prevalence of coronary heart disease. And so there are structural differences, uh, smaller left atrial ventricles uh, and lower ventricular wall thickness in women, more atrial fibrosis in women. Uh, electrical uh, differences are also known, but uh, unfortunately there are treatment differences, less anticoagulation and less ablation in women than in men. Uh, and uh, also the, the clinical presentation is different and the complication uh, are slightly different uh, between women and men. Let's go to clinical presentation and start. Asymptomatic fibrillation was less common among women than men. And uh, in a study of patients visiting the emergency department, women were uh, more likely to have a longer duration of symptoms and to present with atypical symptoms, uh, weakness, uh, fatigue. The presence of atypical symptoms uh, might contribute to worse outcomes seen in women. The symptoms uh, might delay diagnosis and management of atrofibrillation. Uh, the first presentation of uh, individuals with atrofibrillation can be with stroke or with uh, cardiomyopathy. Female sex is a recognized uh, independent risk factor for atrofibrillation related stroke uh, and systemic thromboembolism, uh, accounting for uh, one uh, point in the Chalva score. Several observational studies demonstrated the association between female sex and risk of atrial fibrillation related stroke and thromboembolism. For example, Framingham Earth study uh, has an average ratio of 1.92. Uh, female sex was associated with multivariable adjusted inquisitive fetal stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation not receiving oral anticoagulant therapy and the relationship between female sex and stroke may be variable between population and age groups. Uh, where the female sex confers an additional risk in women age uh, less than 65 years uh, without any other risk factors is really unclear. Also about mechanism of increased stroke risk in uh, women, uh, there are anatomical and structural factors, as previously seen. Social factors, uh, um, older age uh, and uh, social isolation, uh, depression, uh, hormonal causes and uh, atypical symptoms, uh, uh, which are responsible for late diagnosis. There are treatment issues with uh, um, less compliance, uh, uh, reduction uh, of the rate of double and triple uh, antithrombotic therapy, uh, less time in the therapeutic range with uh, uh, anti-vitamin K inhibitor. And uh, mm, so there are comorbidities, uh, for example, uh, heart failure, heart, heart valve disease. Uh, so uh, in the balance between thrombotic risk and uh, bleeding risk uh, we have to consider all this factor but we have also to consider that all these factors are not really different than the same factor uh, in men another issue is stroke severity do women with a death experience more severe strokes 
An answer to this question is provided by data from the Austrian Stroke Unit Registry. So we can see in this figure that uh, women with AF don't only have an increased risk of stroke compared with men, but also experience more severe stroke than men. And uh, there are also gender specific differences for risk of disability and death in AF related stroke. So you can see uh, in this study the distribution of modifier alpha scale scores in the study population and uh, a larger percentage of women suffer disabling and fatal stroke than men. Let's go to the treatment and prognosis of AF or stroke. So there are set specific differences in healthcare utilization in cardiovascular treatments. Women are less likely to undergo rate control treatment than men. And among individuals undergoing rate control treatment, women are less likely to receive uh, uh, cardioversion and catheter ablation than men. No significant differences exist uh, in the use of our antivirals between women and men. But among individuals receiving the bigger turn, women are more likely to receive the, the lower dose than men. And uh, warfarin and non-vitamin K antagonists uh, uh, have similar effects, uh, similar efficacy, and similar breathing risk in women and men. Um, among individuals receiving warfarin, women might have higher residual risk of stroke or systemic embolism than men. So, uh, in a general overview of treatment of atrial fibrillation in women compared with men, we have uh, some similarities. For example, uh, there is a similarity in the utilization and outcomes of pharmacological cardioversion. Uh, there is a similarity in stroke prevention uh, in the prescription of uh, warfarin and NOAF. Uh, in the risk of bleeding with uh, warfarin, uh, in the efficacy of uh, uh, direct anticoagulants uh, versus warfarin, and in the residual risk of stroke uh, with direct anticoagulants and risk of bleeding with direct anticoagulants. There are also some differences. Uh, rate control is more common in women. Rate control uh, may be associated with higher rates of uh, adverse events in women, so electrical cardioversion might be less common, less successful in women, and also catheter ablation. Time interpretive range may be lower in women um, treated with uh, warfarin. The residual risk of stroke with warfarin is higher in women than in men. So uh, the bigger turn, uh, lower dose uh, is prescribed uh, more in women than in men, and uh, uh, lower risk of bleeding with oral anticoagulant is seen overall in, in women than in men. Unfortunately, the participation of women in the anticoagulation trials for stroke prevention in AF is lower than the participation of men. In this picture, you can see the relative rate of women and men enrolled in this trial, and uh, it is uh, disproportionately prevalent uh, the number of men than women. In Garfield AF registry, the overall rate of anticoagulant use did not differ between women and men. And both uh, under treatment and over treatment uh, were common regardless of sex. In the pinnacle registry, women were more likely uh, than men to receive uh, aspirin instead of uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, also after multivariable adjustment. And in a meta analysis uh, of the warfarin treatment groups uh, in several trials, women had a significantly higher residual risk of stroke and systemic thromboembolism than men. But major bleeding rates for men and women uh, with AF and a ADK reported in four randomized trials were similar and direct anticoagulants were associated with significantly less major bleeding in women than in men. And comparing management and outcomes in men and women with non-valvular AF in a population
population base court uh, you can see that uh, there is not uh, a significant difference uh, unless you consider patient age uh, higher than uh, 75 years and uh, this is um, a relevant issue because uh, in the elderly we have more women than men and men and women with AF uh, finally had a similar risk of ischemic stroke except for women 74 years uh, of age or older uh, this subgroup uh, had a higher risk of stroke and uh, this finding support uh, using a similar anticoagulation strategy for prevention of stroke in men and women with a similar number of risk factors and uh, female risk is also an independent risk factor for, uh, for stroke for systemic hemolytic event um, in patient for other fibrillation uh, treat uh, using edoxaban uh, women had higher baseline endogenous uh, factor than activated uh, activity in comparison with men. So women are uh, at potentially increased risk of thrombosis. Uh, but treatment with an higher dose edoxamol regimen caused uh, a greater reduction of this activity in women than in men. Uh, so finally, uh, the, the result is a similar intensity of achieved anticoagulation. And uh, the, the higher dose uh, edoxamol regime reduced the risk of several bleeding outcomes uh, to a greater extent in women. So finally, uh, in comparison with men, women with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation were older, with higher CHAPA scores and higher comorbidity burden than men. But despite these factors, women were less likely to receive oral anticoagulation to reduce the risk of stroke, uh, including also diet oral anticoagulants. And women, in comparison with men, had uh, uh, higher risk of ischemic stroke and hospitalization, but lower risk of intracranial bleeding. Uh, so the conclusion is uh, really easy. Anticoagulate women as much as men. Mortality is uh, the last issue uh, in prognostic evaluation. So the investigator from the Framingham Earth Study established that AF was associated with increased mortality in women than in men. And uh, uh, multiple longitudinal studies uh, evaluating uh, the interaction um, between sex and AF related uh, risk of death uh, did not uh, um, provide uh, conclusive results. So a meta-analysis of uh, 19 studies, uh, but uh, were disease-based samples, showed uh, an increased risk of all-cause mortality in women compared uh, with men, but uh, the, the bias population uh, doesn't allow to, to consider this result as final. And at the end of my talk, I have a few take on Women in general have a lower age-adjusted incidence and prevalence of uh, AF than men. But uh, given the greater longevity of women, the absolute number of men and women with AF is similar. Prevalence of major risk factor uh, is different by sex. Women have higher prevalence of uh, arterial hypertension and valvular disease and lower prevalence of coronary heart disease than men. Women are more likely to present with atypical symptoms uh, and have longer duration of symptoms and report worse quality of life and more frequent depression than men. Female sex is a risk factor for AF-related stroke, thromboembolism, myocardial infarction and mortality but it has not been associated with incident heart failure or donation. Um, an increased thrombotic risk in women uh, is uh, really multifactorial. Um, it involves uh, hormonal changes after menopause, uh, uh, structural endocrine, lifestyle social factors, uh, and women benefit from anticoagulant treatment and uh, the bleeding risk is really similar to men. Uh, women should therefore receive equivalent treatment to men based on the validated criteria for anticoagulant therapy. And 
at the end, women are not represented equally in the large randomized studies, and sex-related information in many fields is still lacking. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for that talk. And we're going to um, have a time to answer questions live at the end. So um, please do put your questions into the Q&A. Um, for those who were noticing the low volume, that was it's a pre-recorded talk, but um, I think it's only an issue with that particular talk. So we should be fine going forward. I found also it's easier to hear with headphones. So with that, I'm going to move on to introduce our next speaker. And um, this is Dr. Ana Caterina Fonseca, and she is a neurology consultant at the Hospital de Santa Maria in Lisbon, Portugal, and she's a professor of neurology and pharmacology at the University of Lisbon. And her main research interests are stroke prevention, cryptogenic stroke, and precision medicine. And she's going to be speaking to us um, today about stroke prevention in women. We're gonna start with the little poll, pretest poll. So go ahead and put that up. So let's see. I'm not allowed to vote. Which of the following are true? Women report less side effects from antihypertensive. Hypertension is more prevalent in older women than men dependent edema, more common in women than in men, or antihypertensive drugs are less effective in women. So I think we've had some time to vote. So go ahead and close the poll. And let's see. So most people think hypertension is more prevalent in older women than in men. Well, we'll find out. So go ahead and start the talk and um, put your questions in the Q&A. We know that women have a 20% lifetime risk of stroke, and the majority of stroke related deaths occur in women. Therefore, to reduce the burden of stroke in women through primary and secondary prevention should be a goal of public health. There are two main level strategies that can be used to achieve prevention individual level strategies, which are the ones that I'm going mainly to address in this talk, and population level strategies. Individual level strategies are um, primarily used by healthcare providers and target those with the highest level of a relative risk. Individual level strategies for stroke prevention are mainly based in two components to control. When thinking about vascular risk factors in women, we have to be aware that previous reviews and guidelines. So first of all, we need to know what are the stroke risk factors in women. This can be broadly defined in three main groups. Those that are women specific, and they include things like pregnancy, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, oral contraceptive use, or postmenopausal hormonal use. Risk factors are stronger or more prevalent in women, that include migraine with aura, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, or hypertension. And stroke risk factors that have a, a similar prevalence to men, but an unknown impact, that includes physical inactivity, age, prior cardiovascular disease, diet, smoking, obesity, or a metabolic syndrome. It's important to have an idea that most of the guidelines that are currently used to guide primary prevention of stroke in women have indeed a very low quality of evidence. This is mainly because most of the data that was used to develop specific evidence-based guidelines for primary stroke prevention in women were derived from coronary artery disease studies, in which stroke was a secondary outcome. And also, it's also important to have an idea that women were underrepresented in stroke prevention trials cohorts. So what do we know regarding women-specific risk factors? We currently know that adverse pregnancy outcomes defined like hypertensive disorders. There are studies indicating that preeclampsia doubles the risk of stroke in later life. That's why the American Heart Association guidelines for primary professional stroke in women advise to consider evaluating all women starting six months to one year postpartum, as well as those who are past childbearing age, for a history of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and to document their history of preeclampsia and eclampsia as a risk factor for stroke. It's also advised to evaluate and treat for cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, obesity, smoking, and dyslipidemia. An interesting study was recently published by Milo in Neurology. It explored the issue regarding hormone contraceptives. They are an effective. 
I am interrupting the screen sharing because I think there is an issue with how the audio was recorded on top of her slides. And I would like to ask um, Ana Catalina Fonseca if she would be available to present her slides live so we avoid this issue um, of the content going too fast. Yeah, sure. The sharing. I will then uh, go back and uh, to the beginning of the presentation. We select the right slides. Would you like to share your screen or should I put your presentation on? Um, you can put my presentation on and I'll just, uh, or can I just put it here? Just. Okay. We can see it. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, we know that women have a 20% lifetime risk of stroke, and its majority of stroke and related deaths occur in women. Therefore, to reduce the burden of stroke in women through primary and secondary prevention should be a goal of public health. There are two main level strategies that can be used to achieve prevention individual level strategies, which are the ones that I'm going to address in this talk and population level strategies. Individual level strategies are um, primarily used by healthcare providers and target those with the highest level of the relative risk. <laughs> Individual level strategies for stroke prevention are mainly based in two components, to control vascular risk factors and antidrobotic treatment. When thinking about vascular risk factors in women, we have to be aware that previous reviews and guidelines have largely focused on risk factors specific to women, with the predominant focus on operative factors and therefore younger to middle aged women. However, stroke risk and prevalence increases with advanced age, and women tend to be older than men at the time of their first stroke. Advanced age in women confers unique stroke risks that are beyond operative factors. Also, women have a greater life expectancy than men that increases their lifetime risk of stroke, especially in the age group of 55 to 75 years old. So first of all, we need to know what are stroke risk factors in women. This can be broadly defined in three main groups. Those that are women specific, and they could things like pregnancy, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, oral contraceptive use or postmenopausal hormonal use. Risk factors are stronger or more prevalent in women that include migraine with aura, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, or hypertension. And stroke risk factors that have a similar prevalence to men but a known impact that includes physical inactivity, age, prior cardiovascular disease, diet, smoking, obesity, or metabolism. It's important to have an idea that most of the guidelines that are currently used to guide primary prevention of stroke in women have indeed a very low quality of evidence. This is mainly because most of the data that was used to develop specific evidence-based guidelines for primary stroke prevention in women were derived from coronary artery disease studies in which stroke was a secondary outcome. Now it's also important to have an idea that women were underrepresented in stroke prevention trials cohorts. So what do we know regarding women-specific risk factors? There's data indicating that preeclampsia doubles the risk of stroke in later life. That's why the American Heart Association guidelines for primary professional stroke in women advise to consider evaluating all women starting six months to one year postpartum, as well as those who are past childbearing age, for a history of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and to document their history of preeclampsia, eclampsia as a risk factor for stroke. It's also advised to evaluate and treat for cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, obesity, Pregnancy disorder for pregnancy. They analyzed data from the California teacher study, a prospective cohort study, and they explored the relationship for prior pregnancy disorder of pregnancy and later stroke and interaction of disassociation with aspirin as statin use. 
They found that the history of hypertensive absorption of pregnancy independently increased the risk of future strokes. In addition, they found that aspirin use reduced the risk of subsequent strokes, especially stroke occurring before 60 years of age, and that aspirin did not increase the risk of the kernel hemorrhage in this population. No significant association was found for statin use. Although this cohort has many limitations, this uh, further raises the hypothesis that women who had an hypertensive disorder pregnancy might benefit from private prevention therapies related to the stroke. More studies are needed to confirm these findings. Regarding oral contraceptives, they are an effective form of birth control. However, they should be used with caution. The American Heart Association guidelines for private prevention of stroke in women indicate that oral contraceptives may be offered in women with different risk factors, like cigarette smoking or prior traumatic events. Among oral contraceptive users, aggressive therapy of stroke risk factors may be reasonable. And routine screening for prothrombatic mutations before initiation of hormonal contraception is not useful. And before, because a potential doubles the risk, measure of blood pressure before initiation of hormonal contraception is recommended. Regarding postmenopausal hormonal use, we know that menopause is associated with increased stroke risk. Actually, 10 years after menopause, stroke risk doubles. This has been hypothesized to be due to the loss of endogenous estrogen that occurs at menopause. Estrogen has already been shown to be an neuroprotective agent in basic studies. However, the clinical trials that evaluated estrogen as a replacement failed to translate its effects. European Circulation Guidelines for Prevention of Stroke in Women conducted a meta analysis that included the main studies that evaluated the association between postmenopausal hormonal use and subsequent risk of stroke. Overall, they found that postmenopausal hormonal use was not associated with decreased risk of stroke in these patients, contrary to what has been shown in basic clinical studies. Actually, the landmark trial of estrogen replacement, the Women's Health Initiative study, found that women were randomized to combine estrogen with prostatin and increased risk of ischemic stroke. This trial followed women from an average time of 7.1 years, and found that the risk of stroke was increased by 33% for women in the estrogen treatment group. On similar lines to last trial, that included patients with the average year of 71 years that received oral estradiol or placebo over a mean of two point years, showed that women in the estrogen therapy group had a higher risk of fatal stroke. There has been some criticism of these clinical trials after this. they have not been able to reduce the data that we had from basic studies. It is thought that the timing to those in mode administration of hormonal therapy may be critical for its efficacy and outcome. Taking into account the data that we currently have, the guidelines state that hormonal therapy should not be used for primary prevention of stroke in postmenopausal women. And it also in that in postmenopausal women suggested against the use of hormonal replacement therapy to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. And what about risk factors are stronger or prevalent in women than in men? This include migraine or hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Regarding migraine with R, because there is an association between higher migraine frequency and stroke risk, the American Heart Association guidelines for primary prevention of stroke in women state that treatments to reduce migraine frequency might be reasonable, although evidence is lacking. And also, because of the increased stroke risk seen in women with migraine headaches, with horror and smoking, it is reasonably strongly recommended smoking cessation in women with migraine headaches with horror. Regarding hypertension, this is the most common modifier risk factor for stroke in both women and men. There's the highest population to be at risk, and women compared to men may have a higher risk of first stroke with hypertension. Therefore, early and sustained treatment of hypertension is critical. Postmenopausal women are more likely to experience a non-dipping nighttime blood pressure pattern, and therefore women might derive more benefits from blood pressure control using laboratory blood pressure measurement as opposed to conventional blood pressure monitoring. A meta-analysis of 31 large randomized blood pressure trials showed that treatment of hypertension in women aged more than 55 years old was associated with 38% risk reduction mm -hmm. in fatal and non-fatal cerebrovascular events. Therefore, women benefit significantly from this intervention as men. Regarding what type of drugs that should be used to control hypertension, what study shows is that the type of medication used to lower the blood pressure may be less relevant than the achievement of target blood pressure goals 
to only drugs that probably should not be used at first by the agents are alpha-1 antagonists. Currently, there's no evidence that there are differences in the response to blood pressure decreases between genders. However, in Alaska reviews that have eliminated the efficacy of antipersic drugs, there was no mention that sex-specific efficacy endpoints were evaluated. In order to have efficacy, the drugs should be taken according to what they were prescribed. Therefore, it's very important to ensure medication adherence. And one of the factors that decreases adherence to medication is the presence of side effects. We know that side effects tend to be more frequent in women than in men regarding antipertensive drugs. Therefore, side effects are diuretic induced certain subtotalic concentration, injecting seen converting enzyme inhibitor induced cough, and calmial blocker related dependent edema are more prevalent in women than in men. What we should do is actively ask the patient for these side effects, and if they are intolerable, they should, then the medication should be changed for the class of antiparticid drugs. There are specific drugs that can be used in pregnancy. The ones that are related to reginin, and angiotensin, and endosterone axis are contraindicated because they are teratogenic. They include AC inhibitors, digitensin receptor uh, blockers, and renin inhibitors. Regarding blood pressure levels to achieve in secondary prevention, there are no specific mentions to gender differences. And therefore, the overall recommendation also applies to women. It is stated in the guideline that in people with previous ischemic stroke or TRA, we suggest aiming for a blood pressure target of less than 130 or 80 millimeters of mercury to reduce risk of ischemic stroke. The recommendations regarding diabetes management for fire prevention of stroke are currently similar for both women and men. Same applies regarding to values of glycotemoglobin that should be achieved for secondary stroke prevention. There are no specific mentions to gender differences. However, there appear to be some sex-specific effects of pharmatherapy for diabetes. Namely, glucagon-like one peptide one receptor agonists have better glycemic control among men than women. However, women showed more weight loss. The isolin binge appear to have better glycemic reduction in obese women, whereas non-obese men respond better with sulfine rage. Considering atrial fibrillation, the American Heart Association guidelines of primary stroke prevention of stroke in women indicated considering the increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation with age and the higher risk of stroke in elderly women with atrial fibrillation, active screening, particularly of women more than 75 years of age in primary care settings using pulse taking followed by an ECG as appropriate is recommended. Also, that oral anticoagulation in women aged less than 65 years old with atrial fibrillation alone this means no other risk factors. Women with SHADS2 equal to zero or SHADS2 VAS equal to one is not recommended. Regarding secondary prevention, all patients with atrial fibrillation, independently of their gender, should be anticoagulated, either with a VK antagonist or a new oral anticoagulant. Primary prevention measures regarding this epidemia are similar in women and men. There is no indication for primary prevention for women between 40 to 65 years of age if they are at low risk. And we should bear in mind that pregnant women that are women intending to get pregnant in the next one to two months should not take statins. Regarding secondary prevention, there are also no gender specific mentions. And this stated in the European Stroke Concession Guideline that in people with ischemic stroke or TIA, it's recommended for an LDL cholesterol level less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And also that in people with ischemic stroke or TIA, it's recommended to use a statin to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. It's really important that both men and women receive flat right therapy. In a study that was conducted by the American College of Cardiology, they went to analyze current use of statins. All patients had some kind of indication to use a statin either for primary or secondary prevention. What was found was important gender differences. They found that women, although they had the same indication to use a statin than men, were less likely to have ever been prescribed a statin. They also found that women were uh, had a higher probability of refusing the treatment. This was because they had a, a, a higher probability of believing that uh, the medication could be harmful. And actually, women had a higher probability of discontinuating or stopping the medication because women reported a higher amount of adverse events, namely muscle pain. And what about the risk factors that have a similar prevalence in women and men? 
What do we know regarding obesity, metabolic syndrome, and lifestyle factors? Well, in the human self study, a healthy lifestyle profile was defined as never smoking, alcohol consumption between 4 and 10.5 drinks per week, exercise more than four times per week, BMI less than 22, and a diet high in several fiber folate omega 3 fatty acids with a high gravity of polyunsaturated to saturated fat and low in trans fat and glycemic load. And what has shown was that women with high score in this scale had a 55 lower risk of stroke than women with lowest score. Therefore, the guidelines recommended all women, regardless of risk, should be counseled on lifestyle recommendations like smoking cessation, heart healthy eating patterns, regular physical activity, and weight management. This is an important point because we usually tend to think about mainly pharmacological measures to achieve primary or secondary prevention, but non-pharmacological measures are also very important. You know what about using aspirin for primary stroke prevention in women? Well, the American Heart Association guidelines for primary prevention stroke in women that were published in 2013 stated aspirin therapy with a dose between 75 and 355 milligrams per day is reasonable in women with diabetes and less contraindicated. And if I risk women, this means a one with a 10 year prodigious cardiovascular risk superior to 10 as an indication for aspirin with intolerance of aspirin therapy, clopidogrel should be substituted. They also state that aspirin therapy can be useful in women more than 65 years of age if blood pressure is controlled and the benefit of ischemic stroke and myocardial infarction is likely to outweigh the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding and more. However, the data that we have regarding antibiotic treatment for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease has evolved over the last years. And some of the randomized clinical trials that were published more recently did not replicate these findings. These clinical trials include the RIF trial and the SEM trial. In the RIF trial, that included use a dose of 100 milligrams of aspirin for primary prevention, did not show a significant effect of aspirin. Indeed, the event rate was much lower than expected, which was probably reflective of contemporary risk management strategies, like more uh, tight control of blood pressure and use of statins. So it probably made study more representative of a low risk population. And the role of, of aspirin in primary prevention among patients at moderate risks could not, for be, could not therefore be addressed in these randomized clinical trials. Nevertheless, findings with respect to aspirin effects are consistent with those observed in previous published role with in sub-analysis regarding gender that was done in the RIVE trial, women did not benefit from aspirin for primary prevention. Regarding secondary stroke prevention there, and antibiotic treatment, there is no gender-specific mentions. The foreign European circumcision guidelines stated that in people with previous ischemic stroke or TIA, it's recommended long-term use of antibiotic therapy to reduce the risk of recurrent stroke. Finally, I would like to recall the role that education has to achieve prevention. It's really important to empower the patient, to let him know what are his own specific risks of having a stroke, what he can do to control the vascular risk factors. And this campaign should be repeated from time to time. It's really important also to have campaigns that are related and aimed to women directly, like this one that was done by the old stroke organization. You know, what are take home messages I'd like you to take? Well, that primary prevention is essential component in the fight to reduce the burden of stroke in women. But you really need to monitor risk factors, either in the primary or secondary stroke prevention setting. It's also really very important for multi healthy lifestyles. And in the future, it is really important to have studies that report that is separately for men and women certified by age when examining sex difference in disease rates. Okay, thank you for that talk. That was um, terrific. And I'm glad that we were able to uh, fix the tech difficulties. And um, I believe that all of the technical issues will be fixed and the final version that's uploaded will be um, a more smooth version. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to move to our last speaker. Uh, this is Professor Anita Arsovska. And she's going to be um, talking to us about stroke in pregnancy and in the postpartum period, which is, of course, something I'm very interested in. So she is a neurologist at the University Clinic of Neurology at the University 
Cyril and Methodius um, in Skopje, North Macedonia. And her interests involve stroke management, neurosynology, neuroimaging, and she's the Associate Commissioning Editor of the World Stroke Academy. So let's do our pretest poll. And what do we think is the strongest risk factor for stroke in pregnancy and perperium? And so go ahead and make your choices. Give you just a few seconds. This is not high stakes. All right, go ahead. You can close the poll. Let's see. Everyone thinks it's preeclampsia. Well, that's what I think too. But we'll we'll see what she says. And go ahead and start the video. Thank you very much. Dear Chair, dear colleagues, I'm going to speak on stroke in pregnancy and puerperium. I have nothing to disclose. So pregnancy and puerperium are female-specific stroke risk factors. Pregnancy-associated stroke accounts for 80% of strokes in women that are younger than 35 years. The stroke incidence is 25 to 34 cases per 100,000 deliveries. At the time of delivery, the risk is increased nine times, and in the early postpartum period, there is three times increased stroke rate. During pregnancy, there are significant physiological changes, such as increase in hormonal activity, and also significant cardiovascular, hemodynamic, and coagulation changes. These changes sometimes might increase the risk for cerebrovascular, cardiovascular, and thromboembolic events, and actually might reveal pre-existing comorbidities or conditions in pregnant women. During pregnancy, there is a hypercoagulable state, which is a physiological change, with marked increase in the levels of fibrinogen and factor 8. Other factors, such as factor 7, 9, 10 and 12, might be increased, but to a lesser extent. During pregnancy and labor, the fibrinolytic activity is depressed. As a common complication, deep venous thrombosis might occur, and this occurs in 1 to 2 percent for vaginal delivery, and even uh, more, 2 to 10 percent for C-section delivery. Also, a pulmonary embolism might occur as a potential complication. Risk factors for pregnancy-related strokes are hematological disorders, pre-eclampsia and eclampsia, gestational diabetes, postpartum period, race, and age older than 35 years. In general, risk of stroke is increased with increasing age, and in women, this risk is increased dramatically when they are aged between 35 and 39 years, and it is even more increased uh, in women that are older than 40 years. So it is 90.5 per 100,000 deliveries. Hematological disorders might also contribute to stroke during pregnancy, such as anemia that may result from blood loss that results in cerebral hypoperfusion, also, thrombocytopenia and sickle cell disease might be a cause of stroke during pregnancy. Preeclampsia is defined as a new onset of hypertension and proteinuria, or new onset of hypertension and significant end organ dysfunction with or without proteinuria after 20 weeks of gestation or postpartum in a previously normotensive patient. Increased risk is associated with first pregnancy, advanced maternal age, black heritage, 
and past diabetes and hypertension. Preeclampsia occurs in 5 to 7 percent of all pregnancies, and in one out of 200 women who have preeclampsia, the blood pressure becomes high enough to have seizures, and this condition is called eclampsia. Both are the strongest risk factor for stroke. They account for 24 to 48 percent of the cases and the risk is potentiated by genitourinary tract infection, hypertension, prothrombotic states, and coagulopathies. It is recommended that women with chronic hypertension or history of pregnancy-related hypertension take low-dose aspirin from week 12 of gestation until delivery. Hypertension should be controlled with methyl dopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. It is absolutely forbidden to use atenolol, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers because they have teratogenic effect. We should also consider screening women with preeclampsia six months to one year postpartum and document preeclampsia as a stroke risk factors. We should also evaluate and treat other stroke risk factors such as hypertension, obesity, smoking, and dyslipidemia. Gestational diabetes is also a risk factor for stroke. It is basically the inability to process carbohydrates during pregnancy. So all pregnant women should be screened for gestational diabetes. In many cases, the blood glucose levels return back to normal after delivery. The guidelines from the American Diabetes Association recommend lifestyle behavior change in women with gestational diabetes. And uh, insulin is the preferred medication for treating hyperglycemia in gestational diabetes mellitus. It is forbidden to use metformin and glyburide because they both cross the placenta to the fetus and also have teratogenic effects. Other oral and non-insulin injectable glucose lowering medications lack long-term safety data. Uh, during the first six to eight weeks after delivery, the risk of developing thromboembolic disease is increased. These complications result from injuries during delivery. There is greater risk after a cesarean section than after a vaginal delivery. Data have shown that there is extremely high relative risk due to the decrease in blood volume or due to rapid changes in hormonal status or because of hemodynamic, coagulative, or vessel wall changes. Also, women who have delivered preterm babies or small for gestational age babies, uh, they have higher rates of cerebrovascular events. The risk is increased in women with prior stroke, but the absolute risk depends on the presence of other vascular risk factors. The diagnosis of stroke in pregnancy and puerperium should be done promptly, and the preferred first-line imaging modality in pregnancy is MRI, although it carries some potential hazards such as theoretical biological damage, tissue heating, and potential damage to the fetal ear. It was shown that there is no harmful short or long-term effects on fetus at Tesla uh, less than 1.5. But sometimes MRI is not available and CT scan is the most appropriate tool for rapid diagnosis. It was shown that the fetal radiation dose in non-contrast CT is 5% or 
of naturally occurring background radiation dose during a full-term pregnancy. It is 0.5 to 1.0 milligray. It was also shown that the fetal radiation dose less than 0.1 gray is not associated with increased risk of adverse effects. The fetal exposure is below regulatory limits with use of standard shielding of 0.5 millimeter lead equivalent. It is also possible to use CT angiography or CT perfusion if necessary. And it was shown that no mutagenic or teratogenic effects in human pregnancies were seen after administration of iodinated contrast. There is still a theoretical risk of fetal tirade suppression. So this needs to be evaluated after delivery. And the uh, American College of Radiology recommends that iodinated contrast is used in pregnant women only when no alternative test is available. It is also possible to use contrast MRI with gadolinium chelate, but it traverses the placenta and may accumulate in the amniotic cavity with contrast medium cycling through the fetal, gastrointestinal and genital urinary tract. 0.01% of the gadolinium dose remains present in the fetus after four hours and only traces can be seen after 24 hours. But again, the American College of Radiology recommends that gadolinium-based agents are used with extreme caution and informed consent. This year, the European Stroke Organization published the guidelines on stroke in women with special attention on management of menopause, pregnancy, and postpartum. So related to this lecture, the questions are whether IVT and mechanical thrombectomy could be used in pregnant women and also in women during the postpartum period. So uh, there is no specific recommendation. Uh, however, the expert consensus statement uh, recommends that pregnant women with disabling acute ischemic stroke who otherwise meet eligibility criteria can be treated with intravenous thrombolysis with alteplase after assessing the individual benefit and risk profile. The same is for mechanical thrombectomy. So again, there is no specific recommendation. However, the expert consensus statement says that pregnant women with disabling acute ischemic stroke who otherwise meet eligibility criteria can be treated with mechanical thrombectomy and that mechanical thrombectomy alone should be preferred over IVT or bridging therapy. So uh, the same recommendations are for use of IVT and mechanical thrombectomy in the postpartum period. Again, the expert consensus statement says that postpartum women with disabling ischemic stroke that occurs at least 10 days after delivery and who otherwise meet eligibility criteria can be treated with IVT with alteplase after individual assessment. And again, also they can be treated if needed with mechanical thrombectomy, which is the preferred method alone over IVT or bridging therapy on individual basis. So in conclusion, team approach is essential for diagnosis and treatment of stroke in pregnancy in puerperium. Planning is also very important and management of these cases should be individualized. We need future studies that would focus on identification of mechanism prevention and management strategies for stroke during pregnancy and puerperium. 
And at the end, I would like to highlight our initiative of the World Stroke Academy, which is called Women in Stroke. Every year we are honoring women who have contributed significantly in this field based on the nomination of the members of the World Stroke Organization. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks so much for that terrific talk. Um, much appreciated. And um, I'm sure that we have some questions. We have been answering questions in the um, in the chat. I um, someone asked a question about imaging. Is it all right if I go ahead and take this question regarding the last talk? Absolutely. Okay, so um, this issue of radiation, this is uh, important um, in terms of stroke imaging when a person is pregnant. In my opinion, um, and in the opinion of various other people, if somebody has a large vessel syndrome and a very disabling stroke, the benefit of CT imaging with contrast is much greater than the theoretical risk that exists. And as um, Dr. Arsovska said, the dose of radiation that the fetus is gonna get is like orders of magnitude below what is considered safe if you shield the fetus. And, um, and then you have to think, you know, sure, if you have an MRI just sitting there open, ready for a patient, um, but you can't even do MRI perfusion because MRI contrast is really not recommended. And so I would just go ahead and do it, whatever is the fastest, if someone's having a really big stroke. And the other thing that's really important to remember is that um, up to half of pregnancy associated strokes are hemorrhages. And so waiting that extra, even if it's 15 minutes to get to an MRI, and that's in the best of worlds, um, you, this may be actually really life-threatening. So that's my point of view is I go for CT because it's the fastest if the person's really having a stroke. Now, if the person's having like tingling in their fingers, that's a different story. Then you can wait for the MRI. But if they're having a disabling stroke syndrome that could be hemorrhage, that could be large vessel occlusion, it's no question in my mind that the benefit is greatly outweighs the risk. So. Um, that's my opinion. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else disagrees. Uh, yeah, I would like to add that I completely agree with you because usually the mothers as well as the doctors are concerned when CT is performed in pregnancy. They have concerns about the uh, teratogenic and carcinogenic effects of the ionizing radiation to the developing fetus. But as you said, uh, this uh, this uh, fetal radiation dose is actually very, very low um, because in the literature we see that, that uh, a single brain CT scan delivers um, less than 0 0.001 to 0 0.01 milligray. And um, some estimates have shown that the fetal radiation dose below the threshold of 50 milligray has actually a negligible risk uh, in uh, relation to occurrence of fetal malformation or miscarriages or other pregnancy uh, complications. Um, we have to also bear in mind that um, beside the radiation dose, the gestational age of the fetus is also very important. So basically in the first trimester, the probability of uh, development of some malformation or even miscarriages is higher than in the second or the third trimester. And, um, but still, uh, as you said, it is crucial that we perform neuroimaging uh, in order to establish the appropriate diagnosis and actually deliver appropriate management to these patients. And also there is also uh, some concerns when performing uh, CT scans um, with contrast uh, during the postpartum period because uh, there are issues with breastfeeding uh, of, the, of the babies. So basically, also, um, it was seen that actually only 1% of um, the contrast is uh, delivered 
uh, actually, and from uh, that, uh, and th this percent actually, the percentage that goes into the milk is very, very low, but still some experts would recommend that the mother pauses with breastfeeding, uh, for example, 12 to tw uh, 24 hours after the, um, uh, the contrast uh, injection so they could uh, they would uh, breastfeed the, the baby uh, without concerns yeah i actually don't even recommend that they interrupt breastfeeding um but yeah. there's you know there are plenty of data to show that it's perfectly safe and it, it sort of depends on the situation there are situations maybe if a very premature baby um that that would be a different situation but um people are very scared and then it's it's a big deal to interrupt breastfeeding. It's not so easy to breastfeed. So um, especially if you've just had a stroke and there, there are a lot of issues related to that. I think um, we, we need to be more um, proactive about providing the standard care to our pregnant and postpartum patients um, who, and in particular with disabling stroke, because it's not good for a fetus to have a dead mother or a disabled permanently mother. That is definitely, it's not just about the mom, it's also about the baby. It's not healthy to have, um, you know, if, if that could have been avoided. So <laughs> that, that's my point of view. I, I feel that maternal health should always be prioritized, particularly when you're talking about a disabling or fatal disease. Um, so with that, I have to, unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting we did um, run over a little bit, but um, the questions that have not been answered are, will be answered in writing and posted on the webinar. And I'm also gonna let um, Laura take over for me if, um, if any of the speakers wanna stay a few minutes and answer some more, because there were a lot of really great questions in the chat. And I just wanna thank everybody for your terrific talks. It was um, very educational for me and I, uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to participate in this. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, great presentations and great questions were, were raised. Once again, we truly apologize for the technical issues that uh, have occurred and for the sound quality of the talks. But as said, this will be fixed in the recording and you will have access to all of the slides that were presented today. Um, now, on the occasion of International Women's Day at the World Stroke Academy, we wanted to celebrate the achievements and the careers of women in stroke, and therefore we would like to share some additional uh, resources on this topic. Uh, we interviewed some outstanding women, um, and we also asked them to contribute with short case studies, e-learning modules, uh, as well as podcasts featuring female patients. So all those resources are available here for you. If you scan the QR code, it will lead you to uh, our World Stroke Academy page. Um, I want to thank our moderator once again, our speakers for being with us today. We will capture all of the unanswered questions and make sure to address those in writing. So you will have access to all of these resources. Um, in the meanwhile, make sure to follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn for any upcoming educational activities, and we will see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much, everyone.